carbon is one of the most abundant molecules in the universe. It is present in all living matter where it plays numerous structural and functional roles. Concentrations of carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere help determine the Earth's temperature, and sunlight captured by plants through photosynthesis provide the energy needed to support life and to support the modern global economy. Given its importance, the distribution of carbon across different reservoirs, characteristics of the different forms it is found in within each reservoir, and how it moves or cycles between the reservoirs over a variety of timescales is a major focus within the field of biogeochemistry. The vast majority of the carbon on Earth is in the deep lithosphere. This reservoir contains 100 million petagrams of carbon, where a petagram is 1 times 10 to the 15 grams. Most of this carbon only interacts with other reservoirs over very long geological time periods. But there are other, smaller, more active pools within this larger reservoir that do cycle over shorter time periods. The first of these smaller reservoirs is the carbon found in surface soils which contain roughly 1,800 petagrams of carbon. Ocean sediments contain about the same amount of surface soils, around 1,750 petagrams of carbon. A third related reservoir is the carbon found in the ground at high latitudes frozen in the permafrost. The carbon in the soil and permafrost pools are made up mostly of dead organic matter, while ocean sediments also contain large quantities of inorganic carbonate rock. These three compartments are identified and treated separately in many biogeochemical studies because of the differences in the way they interact with other reservoirs. Another compartment within the lithosphere that is treated separately are fossil fuels. Estimates of the total amount of carbon in this reservoir range from 4,000 to as high as 10,000 petagrams. This reservoir formed over millions of years from organic matter and soils and sediments that became buried deep in the earth, isolating it and allowing it to undergo transformations into oil, coal, and natural gas. Outside the deep lithosphere, fossil fuels represent the second largest reservoir of carbon on Earth. The largest reservoir is found in the oceans, which contain roughly 38,000 petagrams of carbon. This carbon is distributed among a number of smaller pools. These smaller pools are treated separately because of how they influence the movement of carbon within the oceans and between the oceans and other reservoirs. Most of the carbon in the ocean is in the deep ocean within the carbonate buffering system. This pool contains around 36,000 petagrams, mostly as bicarbonate and carbonate ions. This is a fairly stable pool with relatively high residence times, interacting only slowly with other pools. The next largest pool, around 900 petagrams, is the inorganic bicarbonate and carbonate ions in the surface oceans. This is a more active pool. It is in contact with the atmosphere, allowing it to exchange more readily with the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere through the carbonate buffering system. There is also about 700 petagrams of dissolved organic carbon in the oceans, and a much smaller amount, about 3 petagrams, is present in the marine biosphere. The marine biosphere is dominated by microorganisms, which have very short lifespans, so carbon in this pool cycles fairly rapidly in and out of the other oceanic pools. While the carbon in the atmosphere has a large impact on climate, the amount of carbon in the atmosphere is quite low compared to these other reservoirs. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, there was about 590 petagrams of carbon in the atmosphere. It is mostly in the form of carbon dioxide, with lesser amounts of methane, carbon monoxide, and other low molecular weight hydrocarbons. Both carbon dioxide and methane are potent greenhouse gases, so these relatively small amounts contribute significantly to the warming of the atmosphere. The final major reservoir is the biosphere, which contains around 550 petagrams of carbon, roughly the same amount as was present in the atmosphere prior to the Industrial Revolution. While animals like us are included in this reservoir, it is dominated by plants and microorganisms. Fluxes of carbon between these reservoirs occur at a number of rates and timescales. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, the largest exchange of carbon on an annual basis was the flux from the atmosphere to the terrestrial biosphere through photosynthesis, with about 108 petagrams of carbon per year being fixed by plants. Most of this was quickly returned to the atmosphere by respiration. The next largest flux was gas exchange between the surface ocean and the atmosphere. As with the flux between the atmosphere and the biosphere, this exchange was roughly in balance with only a slight net flux of carbon from the oceans to the atmosphere over time. In addition to these large fluxes, volcanic activity releases about 0.1 petagrams of carbon into the atmosphere every year. 
chemical weathering of rocks transfers a small amount of carbon from the atmosphere and rocks to surface waters. Erosion also creates a flux from soil to surface waters. Once in the water, much of this carbon finds its way to the oceans. Once in the oceans, this carbon can cycle among the pools within the ocean described earlier. From the oceans, about 0.2 petagrams of carbon move from the water column to the sediments every year. And from the sediments and soils, a small amount moves deeper underground. This is the carbon that can slowly transform at depth into coal, oil, and natural gas over millions of years. Notice that prior to the Industrial Revolution, the major fluxes were roughly in balance, with a small net flux of carbon from the atmosphere to the biosphere, and a similar net flux from the oceans to the atmosphere through gas exchange. This all changed in the mid-1800s when we began to clear more and more land for agriculture and burn large quantities of coal, then eventually oil and natural gas. Starting at relatively low levels, these changes have grown until in modern times the use of fossil fuels and cement production transfer about 7.8 petagrams of carbon from the lithosphere to the atmosphere every year. In addition to this transfer, land use changes driven by human activity is causing an additional annual flux of about 1.1 petagrams of carbon from soils to the atmosphere. These transfers has led to an increase in the amount of carbon in the atmosphere from around 590 to over 800 petagrams of carbon, and a decrease in the amount of carbon found in the fossil fuel reservoir. Not all of the carbon that has been put into the atmosphere has remained there. Other fluxes have responded to increased concentrations of carbon in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is an input to photosynthesis, and increased availability of carbon dioxide has caused the flux from the atmosphere to the biosphere to increase from about 108 to 123 petagrams of carbon per year. Respiration from the biosphere back to the atmosphere has also increased, but not as much, increasing from about 107 to about 118 petagrams of carbon per year. The increase in partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has also increased the flux from the atmosphere to the oceans, from around 60 to 80 petagrams of carbon per year. The flux in the opposite direction has also increased. But these combined changes have resulted in a reversal of the net flux of carbon. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, the oceans were releasing small amounts of carbon to the atmosphere every year, whereas currently the oceans are removing carbon. This net flux into the oceans has increased the amount of carbon that is in this already large reservoir. In fact, it is likely that the oceans will eventually absorb much of the carbon dioxide we are currently pumping into the atmosphere. Unfortunately, this flux is relatively slow, so it won't occur fast enough to avoid the worst impacts of climate change our current carbon dioxide emissions are causing. The increased take up of carbon by photosynthesis has also resulted in an increase in the amount of carbon stored in the biosphere, but estimates vary on just how much extra carbon is here given that other activities such as forest clearing and increased agricultural activity is also affecting this reservoir. If you found this video helpful, please consider sharing it and giving it a thumbs up. Feel free to comment with any questions or suggestions, and if you want to keep up with the content here at Science Primer, click the subscribe button.